Mr. Michael DeVaca at the RSVP offices of Catholic Services of Macomb. Mr. DeVaca is 87 years old. His birth is 5-10-1923. Mr. DeVaca resides at 2134 Anita Avenue, Gross Point, Michigan. My name is Dave Brousseau, and I will be the interviewer, and Gary Miglio will be the videographer. Mr. DeBacher, would you state for the record the branch of service you served in? I was with the 76th Infantry Division, 301st Medical Battalion, attached to the division. Of the U.S.? U.S. Army. 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 Okay, let's go back, <clears throat> if you don't mind, and let's start back when you were in school. Were you drafted, or did you join? I was, I was drafted. Were you out of school at the time? Yes. Did you finish school? Oh, yes. How old were you when you were drafted? Uh, 18, I believe. 18? I think they had just passed the law lowering the age limit. And I got the draft notice the next day. <laughs> they must have put it in the mail. And this was in 1943? Yes. Before that time, can you tell us anything about what you knew about the war and Prior to being drafted, not, were you not too much. Yeah, not aware Except of what you read the paper and what you heard on the radio. What did you think when you got drafted? Were you scared? Were you ready to go kick ass? Or no, what? we expected it. You expected I've been it. Been reading it on the paper, and, and we were. In the, I didn't have a deferred job, so I expected it. And we got. It. When you got out of high school, where did you go for work? I worked at General Motors at the truck transmission on Farnsworth and Riot Club. That's when they first made the automatic transmissions, and they were making them for Oldsmobile and Cadillac only. And that was, was that have been the Hydromatic? Yeah, it was the Hydromatic. How did you get that job? Just applied for it? Well, the principal of the school uh, knew James Cousins, who was an uh, employment manager there, and he talked to him about me. And I went down on the 9th of May to get this job, and he says, you're not old enough. you got to come back tomorrow. So I had to go back the next day on my 18th birthday to get the job, and I did. Where did you go to high school? Lincoln in uh, Warren. Oh, Van Dyke Lincoln. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. That was where the Macomb Community College started. I don't know. Right there at Van Dyke Lincoln High School. As a matter of fact, they used the school for several years before they built it. It's been a long time. Yeah. Uh, were you living at home at the time? Yes. How big was your family? I uh, just had a brother. A brother? Yeah. Older brother? Younger. younger. What did your folks think about this? Well, my mother was deeply concerned. With I'm sure. Uh, she didn't like it well, but we all expected it and accepted it. So there was no shock involved? No. Okay, what's the first thing that happened to you after you got enlisted? Or after you got drafted? Well, they sent me to Fort Custer. Where is that? Uh, Battle Creek, and uh, at school, I was a speed typist, and when I went through Custer, they found out about this, and they needed somebody to type the reports up for the new enlistees, mm -hmm. and they thought I could do a faster job than most of them, so they kept me there for about six weeks as long as they could. <laughs> So I was enlisting new enlistees for a while. 
is that wasn't the extent of your training. Obviously, you must have oh, done no. some other training. Oh yeah. yeah. You mean the following? Oh yeah, I went to Kearns, Utah from there, and uh, I was in the Air Force. Uh, that was our basic training. We went to Fort Douglas and shot the rifles and machine guns and everything. And uh, <coughs> there, they uh, were setting us in different locations. And they told me that they were going to send me to dental school. And I thought this was terrific, going to dental school, being in the Army. So they put me aboard a train. They sent me east. They didn't tell me where I was going, but I kept looking where the sun was coming up, where the sun was going down, and I knew I was getting closer to home again. And uh, <clears throat> I ended up in Alpena, at the Air Force Base in Alpena, Michigan. And when I got off the, the train there, I said, hey, uh, I'm here for dental school. And they started laughing. I said, what are you laughing at? It isn't funny. They said, there's no dental school here. Somebody in Washington made a mistake. So here I was at the Air Force Medical Battalion in Alpena. And no school to go to. We were there for a short time. And uh, they were reviewing all the IQ tests. And I had a fairly high IQ. And they asked me if I wanted to go to the uh, training program in Ann Arbor, become an engineer and an officer. And I thought that was very good. So I accepted it. So I left the Air Force and I went to Ann Arbor and I went to school there. I completed two years of engineering school in nine months. You know, about that time they were running short of troops over in England and in Europe. So they disbanded the, the course. Every one of us were shipped to an infantry division. They shipped me to Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. You know, what was the date of this? Well, I got some dates here if you want to know. I'm just trying to find out where the yeah. war was at the time you got. Well, the, uh, I went to Alpena in uh, April of 43. And I was in uh, Ann Arbor, June of 43. And then I went to McCoy in April of uh, in 44. April. April 1st. So McCoy is where? In Wisconsin. Okay, then what? And then we, they were calling for help over Europe. So they put us through a bivouac thing and maneuvers and they decided the 76 was ready for Europe. So we were shipped to Europe. I left uh, Boston and uh, we got on a troop ship. And in order to dodge the submarines in the North Sea, took us the southern, the northern, the southern route, excuse me, the southern route around by Spain. It took us 12 days, 12 nights to get over there. We had a lot of rough water. Uh, we had a lot of submarine alerts. Where did you leave from? I left from Boston. Okay. And we arrived in Southampton. And uh, they bivouacked us in a, a small town called Christchurch. And uh, they told us we had to take good care of the homes. There were big mansions we lived in. And we stayed there for a little while until we were ready to cross the English Channel. So D-Day hasn't come yet? Well, D-Day has, has just passed. When you got there? Yeah, when I got there, D-Day was passed. Okay. And we crossed the English Channel, and we landed in La Harve, France. And from there, we went across part of France into Belgium. stayed at St. Hubert quite a while. We would stop once in a while and regroup and go on. Uh, when I was there, 
there were quite a few V-bombs going over the Germans were shooting. The buzz bombs? Yeah, buzz bombs. And uh, one went over just to the next block from where we were. It went awry and hit the ground and exploded and killed quite a few people. But this us. Uh, what did you think about those? Yeah, you could hear them sputtering going over at night as you lay there trying to sleep. You could hear the, the bombs going over. So well, well, so, scary? Oh well, yeah, it was kind of scary. You didn't know where they were going to land. You didn't know if they were going to hit you or... Well, neither did they really. No. So from there we... Uh, so you're the, part of the infantry at this point? We are attached to an infantry division. We're kind of like a mass unit. We had 20 doctors with us. Ah, uh, okay, so you're with. still in the medical. I was still in the medical battalion. Okay. And uh, we headed for uh, Luxembourg. And we stayed in Luxembourg for a while. And then we left Rus uh, head, The heavy fighting took place after we left Luxembourg. We lost over 500 men going from there to the end of the war. Now, where were you in relation to the initial D-Day invasion group? Were you following them or were you leading them? No, they were ahead of us. Okay. They were ahead of us. We uh, replaced 80, I think it was the 89th Division, who had been fighting quite a long time and they wanted some relief and they had lost a lot of men already, so we relieved them. And were you close to the front, like most Not mass units were? Not far away, but we were right up in the front line. Mm -hmm. The infantry medics evacuated some of their troops to us, like they did in the mass unit you see out there. And uh, we had a lot of good doctors with us, they had 20 of them. They took care of a lot of people. <laughs> and, uh, and then we headed south. And uh, we crossed the Rhine at St. Gore. The 301st Engineers threw up a pontoon bridge for us because all the bridges had been blown out. And we crossed the Rhine at St. Gore. And we got to the other side, we headed back north again towards Castle. Uh, I got a bit I would tell you about on the way to, to Castle. I was driving a jeep, and I was by myself. And a German soldier came out of the forest, and he had his arms up. And I knew he wanted to surrender. He didn't have any weapon or anything. I was a medic. I didn't have any weapons. We weren't allowed to carry weapons. So I picked this guy up, and I figured, well, I'd take him to the prisoner of war camp. So I drove up to the castle. And the prisoner of war camp was gone. And this guy wouldn't get out of the jeep. He was afraid he was going to get shot. <laughs> so I said, what the devil am I going to do with this man? So the Germans were still operating their own hospitals. I said, oh, I got the idea. <laughs> I took him to the hospital. I said, this guy is very sick. Put him in the hospital. Because I was an American soldier telling the Germans what to do. Because they had been all captured by them. They took him in there, and that's how I get rid of my freedom. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't know what to do with him. Uh, <clears throat> and from there, well, we just headed towards the Russians, I guess, and till we met the Russians. During this trip, were there any places that you stopped? Oh, yeah, we stopped were very you often. Had some activity going on you could share with us? Oh, yes. <clears throat> well, uh, there was one German, he, he was hiding in the back of a, of a house, and he was badly injured. And Gagarin was sitting in his leg. And he was afraid to come out because the Americans were going to kill him. So. And uh, I convinced him no. We're going, to kill him. we're going to help him. So I helped this fellow out. I took him to one of our doctors, and they operated, and I think they saved his life. But uh, 
were, were these Germans that you came into contact with, were they younger? Oh yeah, there was a lot of them that didn't want to fight. Yeah. They, they were all Nazi troopers, you know. They were people just like us. Yeah. They wanted to go home with their families and do what they wanted to do. But when you get the diehard Nazis, they were bad. We uh, captured the barracks one time where the Nazis were trained, the hardcore. And they had beautiful rooms. They had uh, racks where the rifles were sitting, cabinets in the hallways and everything. Of course, the infantry got in there and they just came with them and threw everything out the window and broke up their rifles. And uh, the townspeople were crying out there seeing us do this. But we were trying to destroy all the weaponry they had. Now, how, how were you involved in this as a medical yeah. staff person? Well, I was with the headquarters detachment, and uh, I kept a lot of the records. I had to report the people killed in action, missing in action, and you had to be very accurate. You couldn't make any mistakes. We made a mistake in sending the PIA in, in action to Washington. <laughs> that would be bad news. So we had to be very careful what we did. And, uh, that was part of my duty. So you needed to be part of whatever action was going on uh, yes. to do it, eh? Oh, yes. We got reports daily. I made the, the, the daily report of, of what happened to the division, to the, the, to the, to the battalion. Do you actually have to keep track of body counts? And uh, yes. My best friend was killed when we were across the Moselle River. He was in a boat, and he glided right in his boat, killed him. I was not with him at the time, and uh, he wondered whatever happened to him. We never saw his body or anything, and we got word about two weeks later. They found his body floating down the Rhine River. They identified him by his dog tags. They notified us that he was killed. Hmm. Did you? Ever have one of the officers try to convince you that there were more bodies than you could count? Or? No. <laughs> Never had that. Happen. Always been a lot of discussion about well, nobody knew blowing up the number of people captured and number of people killed. Well, there were times when you, you didn't know if this shell hit some of these people, blow them up. I know when we went through the Ardennes, uh, the snow was just melting. It was very deep and cold, and there were a lot of dead Germans laying there. They were all froze stiff. Of course, we didn't pay any attention to them. They looked up like a thrown people. But uh, there were a lot of... Did you come into contact with uh, civilian people much? Oh, yeah, very often. And they were very nice to us. I had the... Uh, I'll go back to Belgium and St. Hubert. <laughs> I spoke Flemish. And I could speak to everybody there because they spoke Flemish there. What, what is Flemish? It's the Belgian dialect. Oh. No. Uh, it comes from Flanders, the town that I was born in. I learned to speak Flemish because my grandfather and grandmother spoke Flemish at home here in America. They came to America, and I had to speak Flemish though because they didn't learn to speak English. The language came in handy to me over there. Uh, I remember one Easter, uh, there were about 500 GIs and they wanted to go to communion. And the priest couldn't hear confessions. So the priest asked me in Flemish, would I get the pulpit with him and translate? So I got the pulpit and I gave general absolution to about 500 American soldiers in the <laughs> church. <laughs> that was kind of interesting. <laughs> and uh, the, one of the fellows I was with, he was an organist, and he was playing the organ for the mass, and uh, there was no electricity, so you had to work with the bellows, and his bellows was huge, so I was pumping his bellows so he could play during the mass, 
And all he kept saying was, Mike, faster, faster. <laughs> I said, I'm going as fast as I can. <laughs> he wasn't getting the steam out of the organ that he could have. But uh, things like that happened along the way. And as you see in those pictures, too, we were, we were trying to make fun. I got a little going to the pot with the, <laughs> with the urinal, you might say, <laughs> to dump it out in the morning. Really unusual things happen. Uh, one time I was walking, in, when I was in uh, Luxembourg, I was walking towards a barn. There was a toilet in there. And there was an entrance room in off to my right. And he was walking just a little bit ahead of me. And he stepped on a, on a cover for the septic tank. And it, it, it flipped. And he went down in the oh, oh, oh. he went down in the septic tank, and we had to reach down and grab his gun. He had it over his shoulder. He had to pull him out of the septic tank. Now that could have been me if I'd have been two steps faster, but I wasn't. <laughs> and we had to take a hose and hose him down. <laughs> Unusual things happen like that. When when you're in Luxembourg, for example, or some of these other towns, you now taken over the town. Mm -hmm. Was there opportunities to go into town and oh, yeah. go have a beer or go have oh, something yeah. to eat? Or? The USO set up pretty quick, the Red Cross. Oh yeah, we, we, got a, we can get our rations. Get the rations the only place you could go though is USO or did you go to some other? No, you're usually USO. Yeah. When we were back in England, uh, we could go into the bakeries and things like that. Because they had never been closed. Yeah. And that was still available to us. But when we got in Europe, uh, none of those things, the facilities were available to each other. I imagine you wouldn't know what you might meet in one of those places. Oh, yeah. Well, <clears throat> how are the people? I, I'm curious as to how you chased the Germans out. And now they've got a new occupant, so to speak. How do they treat you? How do you... Well, most of the places we took over to stay in were with the Nazis. They're real hardcore. And they weren't there anymore. They were gone. So we occupied empty buildings. But we were under orders not to destroy anything and to take care of these homes because they were people's houses. And there were and nice things in taken the, over by the Germans. And in fact, uh, we were calling for food at one time. When Patton was, well, was Patton's third army, incidentally. And uh, we called back for food. And Patton said, damn the food. I'm going to bring up gasoline for my tanks. You people live off the land. So we would go to these houses and we'd kill rabbits and eat them. They're chickens go in their food cellars and empty their canned uh, goods, anything we could find to eat. We even captured a, a warehouse that was full of Portuguese sardines. And we loaded up our, our vehicles with them. And I ate Portuguese sardines for about two weeks. <laughs> they were good, but they get pretty old after a while. <laughs> Things of that nature happened on the way. They what ran was it like? With Pat, did you have any experiences with him? Well, not that close, no. I saw pictures of him, and uh, he was standing on a pontoon bridge, and he was peeing in the river. <laughs> 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 and they quelled that picture in a hurry. We interviewed a young fellow that was following Pat all the way through yeah. Europe. He was the gasoline guy. And that's all he did was drive gasoline, and he had quite a few experiences to share with us about Patton. Yeah, keeping that gasoline going for all those tanks was a big chore. And we hit a lot of cold weather, mm -hmm. mud, rain, and it was difficult. Bridges were out. They had to throw pontoon bridges across a lot of rivers. But we made it across. And, of course, my experience I talked to it before, but I'll go over it again for you. And uh, going to Belgium, well, we got the Chemnitz and uh, Czechoslovakia. We had to beat the Russians. Well, 
Eisenhower said the Russians are supposed to capture Chemnitz. So we backed out of the town and just waited. And then I asked my commanding officer for if I could go back to Belgium by any chance. We had about 10 days before we were supposed to meet the Russians. And he said I could. So he said I had to find my own transportation. Well, I hitchhiked from Chemnitz all the way to Brussels on army trucks. I slept in Cologne one night, saw the beautiful castles up and down the Rhine. We drove up and down the Rhine with and these trucks. How far was that distance? Oh, I don't know. The farthest from the castle. I wouldn't know. I think we drove all day. But uh, when I got to Brussels, I knocked on the door there. And uh, my uncle answered the door. He lived on Rui Dolph. <laughs> he, he said, Michelle. Incidentally, my name is Michelle, not Michael. I was born in Europe. So uh, I visited with them for a while. And my aunt gave me a nice ring to take back to my wife. <laughs> wow, how nice. Yeah. And uh, then I got the auto bus and went to uh, my dad's hometown in a town called Walker. And I visited with him. Now, that uncle was one that had been in America with his wife, and his wife didn't like America. So he had to go back. So he went back to Belgium with his wife, and his heart was always in America. He never liked Belgium anymore once he got in the United States. And he was talking to me about all the nice things in America, and he'd like to come back, but he never did. Uh, then I took his bicycle, and uh, I went <coughs> heading for the hometown where I was born. And uh, I stopped on the way over there. And uh, I saw a town called Ravens Hill, which is where my aunt was from. And uh, I went out in the field to see some farmers out there. And I tried to explain to them as best I could that my aunt's sisters were living there. But I couldn't think of their names. So he, I told him that the, the man that I'm looking for had been in the United States and came back with a son called Johnny and that he played an instrument. And he said he couldn't remember who that was. So I left him and when I was riding away, I heard somebody screaming at me and I stopped. And he says their name is Service. I said, that's it. As soon as I heard it, I knew. <coughs> so I went to visit with him for a while. And uh, I never drank a thing in my life. I've never been raining a little bit that day. They gave me a little bit of schnapps. <laughs> that did it for me. I had a hard time on that bicycle. But anyway, I waited until I sobered up a bit. And then I rode to the town I was born. And uh, as I was Could a person, you remember it? I, the Could town, you remember? Oh no, I was only six months old when I left. But I, I knew my parents had always talked about it. And I knew the name. And there were signs all over telling you where the town was. It was called Rudder Board. R-U-T-D-E-R-V-O-R-D-E. <laughs> and uh, there was a path running across the field. And I went down this path. And there were three old men standing there talking. And I asked them if they ever, they happened to know my uh, grandfather, Zuna Nord. They said, we were in school with him. Here I am in Europe with a war going on. And I met three people that my grandfather was in school with. So then I went back into town. And what a feast that was. As the pictures show, there's a lot of people in there. Those are all my relatives. I had dozens of them over there, and I could speak their language, and they hadn't spoken to any American soldiers. So they wanted to get all the latest news from me. Now, all this time, how are you keeping track with your folks back home? Well, by mail. So you, letter, you wrote back quite a bit? Back and forth, quite a bit. And, uh, 
Yeah. How did they think about you having the opportunity to meet those? Well, folks? they thought that was terrific. Yeah, I'm sure. Everybody over there thought it was terrific. Too. They, they, you know, like a guts. And, and in fact, when I was talking to some of the people over there, they looked at me and they said, "Sis, when is a Belgian soldier dressed in an American uniform?" Because I could speak the language that well, and they couldn't tell I was not from there. <laughs> but the, I found that quite interesting. Sometimes I hear them talking about me, and they didn't know I understood because I was an American. But uh, everything went well. And then I headed back. Same so way? Hitchhiking across Europe on army trucks. And when I got there, they were gone. The field was empty, the whole division was gone. And I said, what am I going to do now? My 10 days are up. I'm AWOL. <laughs> So I went to the Audubon, I sat on my duffel bag there for a bit, and a, a truck came back with three hundred first engineers. It was usually pretty close to where we were, and he still gave me a lift. So he pulled me back to Reams for Pence, and uh, I caught up with him just in the nick of time. We were heading back through the states to go to Japan. That's what our division Now the war is over in Europe. The war ended in Europe when I was visiting my relatives. Oh wow. On the 10th of May, they came out of their house and told me that the war was over and I didn't know it. <laughs> How did you feel when you heard that? Well, that was great. As you see in that picture there, I got a victory <laughs> magazine. Anyway, uh, where are we now? Oh yeah, when I was in Marine, France, there were three officers, they said, aren't you from Belgium here? Weren't you born here? And I said, yes. They said, we'd like to go to Brussels tonight. Well, Brussels is not real close to Reims, but I said, okay, I'll, I'll drive you down there. So I drove from Reims to Brussels. And I dropped them off and they said, now you pick them up here around 11, 12 o'clock at night tonight. And I said, okay. So I drove back to where my relatives were, and this time I had a Jeep. And the uh, people all climbed on this Jeep. We had 10, 12 people sitting all over the hood and everything, and we were riding around town and having a real good time. This is the second trip that I, uh, I had. Now, now, you're supposed to be in a war. This is a and war. And you're having fun? Oh, I'm having fun. <laughs> I was going to make the best of everything, any situation I could get. <laughs> so anyway, it got to be pretty late at night. I said, boy, I better head back and get, get to Brussels and time to pick up these officers. So uh, I'm driving along and I, there's a Canadian soldier hitchhiking. So I picked him up and uh, I said, I'm going to Brussels. He says, you're going the wrong way. He says, Brussels is the other way. There weren't many signs up <laughs> so I had to turn around and I said, but I'm running out of gas. There's no gasoline stations. He said, just do what I say. So he said, the next depot was a Canadian depot. So we pulled in there and the guy started giving orders. Check his tires, check his oil, fill his gas tanks like this was an important mission. Well, they were all over my Jeep and they fixed it all up. And I said, this guy, thank you. So then I headed for Brussels. I had enough gasoline to make it. If I had run out of gas, I don't know what I would have done, because there were no gas stations. <laughs> anyway, these three officers came out, drunker than skunk. Hmm. These jeeps are wide open. And I said, what am I going to do with these guys? So I took their belts out, and I took it, I strapped the two in the back together with these belts so they wouldn't fall out. And I put the collar of the one sitting next to me, and I drove all night long until I got back to Reims, France. Well, I had a tough time because I didn't know my way too well, and I had to keep looking at signs, and they got concrete markers in the street. I had to get out and look at these markers to see if I was on the right street. I finally, at daybreak, I got back in the, in the camp, got it back in time. So. <laughs> My sin over there wasn't all bad. No. <laughs> I, I got something out of it. So what happened to your brother? Did he get 
in the service too? Oh yeah, he was in the Pacific. And he was aboard an uh, Atlantic ship tank, I think it was. He was a radio man. And he would fly the Pacific for a while. He came back safely. I guess he was saved because the captain didn't know how to run a ship too well. He ran into the dock a couple of times. They had to go in the dry dock <laughs> to fix the ship up. <laughs> so he he wasn't in the, the thick of things. So what play. happened to your orders to go to Japan? Well, uh, when we got back out of Queen Mary, they they said, well, all you guys can go home, except you, Mike. I said, why? He says, you got to go down to uh, uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and check in all our equipment. So all the equipment that we brought back from Europe, whatever we had, I had to go back to South Carolina and check everything in. Well, by then I was really upset. Everybody else went home, and here I am in South Carolina checking the equipment. And they put me aboard a train. It was a troop carrier. It took a while to get home, but I, I made it home. And then they gave me a furlough. And that furlough ran out. They gave me another furlough. They kept extending it because they weren't sure whether they wanted to discharge us or whether they were going to need us over in Japan or something. So I, I went to work for my father. My father was a contractor. I went to work for my father. Here I was a, a, a sergeant in the Army working my dad <laughs> in a flat street. And uh, I finally got my orders that they were going to discharge me. Uh, I had to go to Fort Sheridan. And get my discharge papers, which I have here, and uh, I was out. And incidentally, they awarded me the uh, Bronze Star for service beyond the call of duty. And what was that for? Well, when we were in Germany, we had some people in an outpost, and they had to have some supplies, and I volunteered. Like the jerk, like it. Did you Being, hear about that? Never volunteered? Never volunteered. I found that out with KP and everything else. But anyway, <laughs> I volunteered. And uh, we took a weapons carrier and took the supplies out to these guys. And on the way back, I got turned around. I didn't know exactly where I was. And we looked up and we saw a tall church there. So we didn't see this church going out. We're lost. And then we heard some trucks coming, rolling down the road, and they were talking German. So we right away we put the weapons carrier back at this church, and we kept still. And this convoy of German troops went by. We were behind the lines. I got them lost, and we got behind German lines, and somehow we got away with. It. After they passed, we drove on. We kind of oriented ourselves, and I got back to the house that I was with. But we could, it could have been captured by the Germans <laughs> going out. And that was silly stuff like I, I volunteered for. So I didn't mind the army. So that was I mean, the Brown Star? Like, what's that? So that was the Brown Star? No, that was not that old. I, I was kind of an ambitious guy, and I didn't mind the <clears> army <throat> too much, except for being home and missing my wife and family. But uh, I've always been kind of a, a go-getter. Mm -hmm. Like in high school, they kicked me out in 11 and a half years. They wouldn't let me go 12 years because I took too many subjects and uh, I had too many credits. So they kicked me out of Lincoln High School a half year early. So you had gotten married then before you went? Oh, yeah. Well, I kept writing. Uh, we've been going steady for quite a while. And I don't know. I guess guys think maybe their girlfriend's going to marry somebody else while they're gone. <laughs> so I asked her to marry me, and she wouldn't and wouldn't, and she kept turning me down. And uh, being so close, like in Ann Arbor, I was home almost every weekend while I was in Ann Arbor, or she would come up and see me. So, you know, you kept talking about it, kept talking about it, and finally she agreed. <laughs> Well, we set the wedding date, and 
is when he did build the Red Cross on the date where they shipped it out. And the captain said to me, no, you can't go. I said, what do you mean you can't go? He said, you can't go get married now because you've got a ship out. So I went to the chaplain and went over his head. And I told the chaplain the problem I had. And he went over and talked to the captain. And boy, did I get a reaming out of that captain. He said, don't you ever, ever try that again. <laughs> but I did, I did get home and got married. And I, I shipped out right after we got married. That's another no-no. That's another no-no. <laughs> yeah. Put, put you together and... <laughs> anyway, interesting things happen along the way. So how did you like the experience? How did you like your experience in the service of the war? You know, if, if I had been so lonesome and wanted to get home to a wife and family. I might not have minded the military service. I accepted it for what it was. I didn't book the system. I went along with whatever, whatever they had, you know. And uh, we got along pretty well. You know, it's it's amazing. We had I've been doing this for five years now. And those who talk like you did seem to have had a good time, or at least it wasn't painful. No, it wasn't painful. Who, who did what they should do and stayed out of trouble. That's right. And then there were others who managed to want to do things their own way and were always in trouble and didn't like the experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard at least a dozen people say what you just said about keep your nose clean, do what you're told. and For some reason, you think at that age when they put you in the Army, Send you overseas, you'd have a lot of fear. But I can never remember having fear. I just accepted things for what they were, and this was had to be in. Went along with it. I'm, I'm looking at some pictures here that I was just given, and perhaps you might go over these with us and tell us what they are and what you recall. Those are all my relatives. Not all of them, but some of them. Gary, can you get a shot of these? I don't know if you'll be able to see them. They're kind of small, but if you hold it up to the camera, perhaps he can pick. Oh, yeah. Now, this is family where? My family in, in uh, Wolken. Uh, in Germany. In Belgium. Yeah. Now, the young fellow that you see there, I held in my arms and fell asleep in my arms. After the war, he came to America, became an engineer for General Motors, and is now retired. He's about six foot six, weighs about 250 pounds. Great big man, and I look at him there, I held him in my arms, and he was sound asleep. See him at all? Or? Oh, yeah, I see him. Yeah. Once in a while. Well, most of these people came to America except the older ones. All the young ones came. My cousins, they all worked for General Motors. And uh, some of them worked for my father. Uh, these are people that I was with. They were all in the medics in my detachment. You can have these pictures if you want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That looks like it was part of a, a party, a celebration there? No. We clown around oh, we once in a while. Around. Like the top hats you see in there. Uh -huh. We just clowning around. These are uh, buildings that are bombed out. You remember Every day. where that was? Oh, I don't. Uh, these bombers would go over every day, every day. You know, hundreds of them would go over and drop these bombs and head back and we'd come. Sometimes uh, not as many would return as went out. Yeah, this was over there at Ryan. The bridge was knocked down over the Rhine. I 
I personally took most of these pictures, so there's nothing I cut out of a magazine or anything. It's, I take them. Oh yeah, when we were in the Reims, we were headed back for Paris, and they gave us the rest of the recuperation they called. So we had a pretty good time in Paris for a little while. Uh, I rented a bicycle when I was in Paris, and I rode all over Paris on a bicycle. I went up in the Eiffel Tower, the Champs de la Seine, uh, down the Seine River. It was quite interesting. How soon after Paris was liberated were you there? Oh, yeah, quite a while after. Quite a while after. Is that Michelle? Yeah, that's me. Where did you get that head of hair? Wow. Oh, I used to have curly black hair. <laughs> it's all gone now. <laughs> no, I used to have curly blonde hair. Now it's just curly. <laughs> you, you, you got a lot of hair yet. <laughs> Yeah, this was in uh, Paris too. Uh, they had a display of the Nazi stuff there. Incidentally, I've got some nice Nazi flags home too. Iron brochures. <laughs> that was a good for setting little memorabilia home once in a while. Was that an SS headquarters? No, no, this was in Paris. They showed some of the Nazi atrocities. This is just a troop train that the Germans used to haul their equipment and haul the prisoners of war. When I was issued the uh, Bronze Star, they awarded it to me, but we were moving so fast from France to Czechoslovakia and back to France, it never caught up to me. The paperwork was always following me. <laughs> and when I got back and I was being discharged, the paperwork caught up to me. So I got a letter, in fact I got the letter here. Uh, telling me to go downtown Detroit in front of the city hall and General McCullough, who was the uh, general that answered the Germans when they asked him to surrender at Gaston, he answered nuts to him. It was the same general and he came and pinned the bronze star on me in front of the city hall in Detroit and I had to be in uniform. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was in the Detroit News. I had the picture somewhere but I couldn't find it anymore. And, uh, another incident. <laughs> now here's the good part. All the yeah. women. That's my mother and, oh, my, and my wife. Wow. Yeah, two ladies in my life. Now where was that taken? In Rose Point. Oh. We were sharing our rations with the uh, young children of France. They would always come on whenever they saw us get our rations. We would give it to them. These poor children hadn't seen any chocolate or fruit or anything to eat for a long time. So. Now, is this the bad guys? Oh, yeah, this is the. The Wehrmacht, the uh, planes that we shot down. Oh, we we captured an air air base at Langenselsen in Germany, and uh, they had all kinds of equipment and stuff to land the planes and everything. And the infantry went in there, and they smashed all this equipment. Would make you cry. It was, and they got in these planes that were still on a the runway, 
And with the rifle butts, they smashed the instruments out so they couldn't take off with them again, you know. There was a lot of destruction there. This is aboard a troop carrier. This is aboard a Queen Mary, heading back to the States after the war. It was only a four-day journey. How many were on the were on the ship coming back? Oh yeah. How many? How many? There were fifteen thousand people aboard the Queen Mary, which is a whole division. And I don't know how much the Queen Mary normally carries, but I'm sure it's only a couple thousand. And we just slept wherever we could. Some of us slept in the bathtub, <coughs> some of behind life rafts. And we had A button and a B button. A slept in the beds one night, and the next night B slept in, and the other ones had to sleep wherever they could. And the gangways, up and down the gangways, we slept in the hallways. But we didn't care how we slept, as long as we were going home. And when we got into New York Harbor, they met us with the boats with the fire hoses and everything, and bands were playing, and we had quite a walk over there. Until I was told I had to go down and check all the equipment in. <laughs> At that time, how long had it been since you saw your family? <clears throat> well, it wasn't too long, about a year. <laughs> but I was anxious to get home. Why me? Why did they pick on me to check this stuff in? <laughs> well, they could have sent you to Japan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we were a little concerned about that. We we wanted to thank Truman for dropping that bomb. And I'm sure we would have been here today. We were supposed to have been part of the, the flotilla that invaded Japan, Japan. And, uh, that would have been a bloody mess. That would have been a bloody mess. And most of us would not have come back. And today they're still questioning that decision. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they the question the decision for their people. But our people would have been killed. Well, even for some of the younger people who don't know what was going on at the time. Yeah, they did trade places with them. They'd have been thankful. I don't know if you're interested in any these, these propaganda books that uh, Hitler is and every one of them. Did you stay in touch with any of your buddies? <clears throat> uh, no. There was one living in Detroit, and I stayed in touch with him quite a long time. He's, he's passed away now. Uh, is he interested in any of these things or not? Sure. When did your mom and dad pass away then? Oh, a long time afterwards. Uh, I think my dad passed away in the 60s. My mother, what was it, 70s, 80s? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Exactly. And she was happy to see you get home, eh? Oh, yeah. She was. She was I was still a baby. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. She wrote a lot of letters to me. Now, you, you had those stars that hung in the windows? Yeah. If she had two uh, What was the basis now of the star? They showed you had a, a person in the service. Just in the service, yeah. not overseas? No. So she'd have had two? Yes, yeah, she had two. Yeah. Did they go through a lot of this? Um, I, think the, I think the war was worse for them than it was for us because we knew what was happening. We were all right, but as far as they were concerned, they would keep watching for the postman to see if he was going to bring bad news to us. Yeah. They didn't know. Probably best they didn't know what was yeah. going on. That's right. Of course, they heard a lot. We couldn't say anything in our letters because our letters were all censored. And if you made mention of anything to do with the fighting or what you were doing or what town you were in, they would cut it out or tell you not to write it. So our letters were just 
general letters. We couldn't tell them how things were going, uh, where we were. You could tell them the sun was shining or it was snowing or something, but. Yeah, I remember that time. And, uh... I remember when we were in the Ardennes too. My mother says, oh, it doesn't snow much in Belgium. I have never been so cold in my life. <laughs> snow up to my ears. Everywhere you looked, we were freezing. <laughs> we had to sleep in it. And I, I kept saying to myself, lie, you lied to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, there might be parts of Belgium yeah. where it isn't, I suppose. It was, eh? it was a, a distance away from where she was, but she told me there wasn't much snow in Belgium. But I beg to differ with her. Yeah, there's not much snow in Michigan, but if you go up to yeah. the UP in Houghton, you'll find out that it'll be up to your ears in it. Oh, and another incident. <laughs> you know, uh, there wasn't any tobacco during the war, and the Belgian would take beet leaves and roll them and make smoky things out of them. Well, even that was illegal. And one time I went somewhere with my cousin, and she says, hey, would you carry the suitcase for me? And I says, yeah. And I took the suitcase, and I walked past the gendarmes, you know, all the, the controllers, they call them. I was smuggling tobacco, and I didn't know it. <laughs> she handed it to me, and, and we, we, we were on the train. She opened the door and threw the suitcase out, and somebody was along the tracks and picked it up. I see you made a tobacco smuggler out of me. <laughs> and they thought that was funny. <laughs> there were never times where you guys got into reunions or any of that stuff after the war? <clears throat> you kind of lost track of each other. No. Uh, See, I was with the 76th Infantry here, and there was a guy called Donahue that I got his name, and I, I called him up, and he gave me the telephone number of a few of the fellows that were still with me. I mean, in Europe. And I called him up, and most of the phone numbers were not right, but I found a couple of them, and I talked to them. Of course, they're elderly like I am now, and they're still living, and they're living on the East Coast. Most of the people in this division were from the East Coast. That was a different part of the country. <laughs> How big is your family now? Well, my daughter sitting there. And I have another daughter, two sons. Four. And we all live here in Michigan. And we see each other occasionally. Now, I have had a, a leg amputated, and I'm not able to get around too much, so my two daughters are taking care of me. And I'm staying in one house for a while, and then I move to the other. So uh, I got two hospital beds, one at each house, mm -hmm. and now I, I'm having a little trouble breathing because of my asbestosis. Uh, so I just got a breathing machine for each house. So I can move back and forth with just my toilet articles. Half my clothes are here, half my clothes are there. And I move back and forth. Any grandchildren? Oh yeah, I've got quite a few of them. I haven't of them lately. <laughs> <laughs> How many does he have? Okay, let's see. There's two, four, five, six, seven. That's seven, eight, nine, right? Nine. With, with Alan's four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and great grandchildren, the others, a bunch of them. Are they interested at all in your war experience? Uh, yes, they. I show them some of the articles that I've got. You know, I've got some Nazi flags that uh, my son has right now. And one of them is quite a nice flag. It's used for ceremonial purposes. Got a lot of early stuff around it. And iron bands that the Germans wore. I'm one to pick up little stuff like that and mail it home during the war. And my wife uh, took care of it. Are the grandkids aware of 
the war and they what it was all about? Or? Boys, they're not interested in that school anymore. I had one of the children ask me a few years ago, hey, Grandpa, what, what war were you in? They didn't even know which war I was in. Bailey, you just did an interview with Bailey. Hmm? You did an interview with Bailey. She needed a oh, oh yeah. for school. Yeah, one of the children uh, about two mm -hmm. weeks ago uh, had come up with some information on World War II. And I gave her some pictures and things, and she took it to school and she got a great on it. Well, there'll, there'll be a, a tape made of this interview that you'll be able to take home and share with your family. So they'll be able to see what went on today. Does he take it with him today? Yeah. The DVD, yeah. So you'll be able to take it home with you today. Do you have a place to record that? They're all computer savvy. And <laughs> Except me. The only thing I play on the computer is the casino games. <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to show us? Could you hold up those other those other books that you um, acquired? I don't know if you want to take a picture of this of a picture of these books or not. Sure. I had some other ones too. My son's got those. This is propaganda showing Hitler with uh, all his troops and all of the citizens of uh, Germany. Not much reading in it, it's just a lot of propaganda pictures. Good. How did you come about getting these? Just found them in somebody's house or in the library, I don't remember. But every page is almost the same as Hitler. A bunch of people showed what a popular fellow he was. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us? I don't think so. Have you ever been back to Europe? No, they, they begged me to go back, but for some reason I got busy in the business and never went back. They, some of them came over here, and uh, even some friends uh, came over a couple of years ago, and I drove him around, showed him what he did in Michigan here, and he was doing the same thing in Europe that a factory here in Grand Rapids was doing. So I drove him to Grand Rapids and showed him how things were made here in this country, and he said, it's the same. The machinery that he bought came from Germany, and the machinery that we got came from Germany. Mm -hmm. So they're the same machines in two different countries, making the same product. Hmm. Done. And that was the Greenfield village and showed him around. He was interested in steam engines. Oh. oh he was really interested when he saw it for the village. Hmm. I don't know if there's anything else or not. Do you have anything you want to ask? Uh, what you do with your, your uh, GI benefits? Mm -hmm. What did you do with your GI benefits after the war? Did you go to school or? Oh, no, I, my father was a plastering contractor and I started working for him and I worked for him my entire life and I took over the business many years ago. Here we are today. Oh. Business is bad. 
we had a close up the company oh. for 70 years. Wow. Of course, I'm not owner of it anymore. I, I sold it to my son. Hmm. Well, Michelle, thank you very much for your your time and and the information. Okay. I'm glad to come. Thank you for coming also. Yeah. She's been talking, she been talking about it for a long, long time. I don't know. If you want to see my discharge papers ready, do you? I don't know. You should have that in a frame somewhere. Oh. People don't put that in frames anymore. Graduations. Coincidentally, oh, my naturalization papers. Because I was smuggled into this country, I didn't get a citizenship papers. Back in 1935. See, I, I, I had access to a lot of the records, and uh, I could bring a lot of my records home. Here's the actual record that I had, but I was there. What is that? <coughs> did you type this? Yes. You did? Huh. I typed a whole lot of them, made out a lot of dog tags for the guys. It says marital status, and then it's crossed off. Oh, that was when I first went in. Oh, I see. Not, not later, like was first draft. Detroit Business Institute. Yeah, well, I was going to be a court reporter. I thought that was a neat job, and I used to do the stenotype. You see them in the court reporting, don't you? On TV. Mm -hmm. Well, I still have my stenotype machine, but I've lost all the mm -hmm. ability to take notes. <laughs> oh, I see. This is a copy of your entire service mm -hmm. record. Oh. Yeah. That's got the whole shebang on there. It's amazing that all this was kept manually. I mean, well, there was no way. There'd be on a little chip about the size of yeah, the now. fingernail, <coughs> and there'd been a lot more information on it. Gosh, that's amazing. Is that the first I couldn't one? remember. Is that the first one you've seen? I imagine the Navy took this. Yes, one. it is. Actually, I. First time I've seen, I have no idea what mine would look like. It would be like that. <clears throat> I would have thought there would have been pages, but you know, get it down to one little. No, they couldn't <clears throat> keep uh, records that well. You know, everybody, my God, they had to build buildings all over Washington store. Well, yeah, that's true. Well, sir, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you uh, coming out. Yeah, we talked and about this for daughters. To yeah. we talk thank about, you. We talked about this for a long time. We have. We have. I'm glad we finally did it. You are both the daughters? No, I'm. We're married mom. to brothers. Yes. <laughs>